Good morning and welcome to Thomas Jefferson Unitarian Church. My name's Donna Rebel and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees. If this is your first time here or your 101st time, we are glad you are here. If you carry the weight of a weary world on your shoulders or you enter through the doors with a song in your heart and a skip in your step, we're glad you're here. If you are the loudest voice in the town square or the subtle hand behind the scenes, we are glad you are here. If you have failed once or a thousand times, we're glad you're here. If you sing like angels or mumble behind the hymnal, we are glad you are here. This community is what it is because of your presence. So welcome, welcome into this space of love, support, justice, compassion, fellowship, and worship. We are glad you're here. I have some announcements. Uh, join us for coffee chats Monday through Thursday from 9 to 9.30 and happy hour on Friday at 5. The links are on the website and we're always happy to see a new face. Our special guest this coming Wednesday is Reverend Don Cooley, our justice coordinator, who is joining us to help us process the election results. And from your name change steering committee, in the next day or two, you'll receive a survey asking for your favorite names. We've generated many wonderful options through congregational input and the expertise of a professional naming company. Now we need you to help to begin narrowing our list. TJ is partnering with, partnering with Evolve for a bright side cleanup this coming Saturday, November 7th in Cary Gobert Cox Park along River Road from 10 to one. Find details in our monthly newsletter Call Debbie Horve in the office to RSVP. We'll order you a shirt and supplies for the cleanup. And last but not least, we have a special video made by our Sunday service committee for your consideration. It lasts less, about a minute. Thank you. Hello, I'm David Nicholson. I'm part of the Sunday service planning committee here at TJ. Our committee is responsible for setting up the guest lectures here about once a month. We strive to make sure our lectures are educational, ethical, and of course, entertaining. Unitarians are known for having open hearts and open minds, so we try to find people that reflect those values. We have had poets, writers, and of course, community leaders all come and talk about what's important to them. We listen to all forms of mediums, including the Bible, the Tanakh, the Quran, and we want to just inspire love and kindness towards others in our community. If you're interested in helping, please contact Bev Anderson, whose information can be found in the church directory. We hope to see you become a part of our amazing community. Thank you. I'm Ellen Sisty Wade, and I invite you to join us for the chalice lighting. If ever there was a time for a candle in the darkness, this would be it. Using a spark of hope, kindle the flame of love, ignite the light of peace, and feed the flame of justice. Good morning. Today is a special day here at TJ. We are kicking off the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee's Guest at Your Table program, and it will run all through the month of November. There's a lot of information in your November issue of Tapestry. We're gonna to begin today by showing you two short videos that are the words of two of the partners involved in this year's very important Guest at Your Table outreach for folks of all ages. Um, that's one of the challenges I'm facing right now is just the, uh, the, the partnerships and the collaborative work that is so important is being um, constrained. Uh, and, it, and I think it doesn't have to be that way. I think there's a, a level of um, co-authorship and collaboration that is deeper and can can be done uh, but there has been a reluctance I think people's you know people's next published article is 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 writing on the fact that they're leading the work 
they can't co-lead, they can't co-author. It, it doesn't work in that in that way for them. So, and that's why I really like working with UUSC because uh, they're kind of free from that uh, those confines. They're not motivated by that uh, that that ambition. Uh, it's 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 much healthier, I think, in terms of a collaborative partnership for for our community. And so some of the challenges that I see and, uh, and being addressed uh, with UUSC's partnership um, uh, has been, you know, that, that way that we do our work and what motivates us in the end and what time, timelines and restrictions that we are given to do the work, um, just being more, uh, uh, I guess, reflective of the local context. You never know the meaning of home until you've lived in more than one. I've been many places in my short lifetime, different states, another country, different people and surroundings, but I've always longed for it and returned home. There's nothing like the smell of the fresh morning air when you first step outside your front door down the bayou. The dampened leaves and grass and the smell of the bayou right across your street. If you could ever smell peacefulness, that would be it. I belong to the Grand Cayu do like band of Biloxi Chittimacha Choctaw Indians. I am proud of my heritage and culture. My people are proud and strong. We instill this in our children from birth as we must overcome many obstacles in our Bayou homeland of Louisiana. We have to fight for education opportunities for our children, jobs, hurricanes, our land, and our way of living. The loss of our homeland is the hardest battle to overcome, but we will never give up. We are relentless. From land being swindled back in the 1800s, hurricanes, and the scariest villain yet, land erosion. We lose football fields every day. The government doesn't do anything to save our land, and neither do the oil companies who are responsible for digging the damaging canals many years ago. These companies reap the rewards while we are left to sink into the Gulf of Mexico. They didn't rape Mother Earth. They have destroyed her and my people and our heritage with their lack of morality and common sense. These people have completely missed the concept of my favorite proverb. We do not own the land. It was not given to us by our ancestors. It was loaned to us by our children. There were once many trees on our land and they sink away or die from saltwater intrusion. The vastly wooded areas we used to run barefoot in as children are becoming less and less as time passes. Things are changing so quickly. I fear that my grandchildren will never know the joys of what I experienced as an Indian child living on the bayou. The hurricanes come and ravage our community with wind and water. Our homes are left unprotected by our local government. We are unable to afford the necessary insurances to cover our properties due to the lack of protection so desperately needed. We are given no choice but to struggle to rebuild or relocate to higher grounds outside of our community. They say we can't be saved. They say that we have to relocate to preserve life. Once again, they have proven us to be expendable in their eyes. But we have proven that we never back down from the impossible. We will continue to fight for our way of life, for ours is unlike any other. We will fight until the last tree has died until the last bit of land has washed away. We will always fight for our home. Now it's time for the offertory. We're asking the TJ family to give generously to the work of our church community. A check to the office is always welcome, but it's also easy to electronically designate an amount by clicking on the bottom of the website. Thanks for taking the time to support our church. Too often, the history taught in our early school days silenced the narratives of the marginalized. Most textbooks have misrepresented minority experiences. Enslaved people were immigration workers. The first Thanksgiving was a peaceful dinner between Native Americans and European settlers. 
Asian Americans were often entirely absent. Hispanic history is a footnote. Jermaine Fowler's work seen, seeks to shine a light on these obscure stories, to tell the untold stories and truth of history, to show the connected humanity of us all. As one of the nation's upcoming and um, nation's up and coming public educators, Jermaine Fowler's work questions where we place ourselves in the legacy of history. He is the creator and host of the Humanity Archive podcast that aims to push the boundaries of knowledge. Jermaine's work deals with unsettling history and the current reality of today's world. Post-industrial cities stricken by poverty, racism, inadequate health care, and educational in inequality. In spite of this, Jermaine offers an underlying hope by studying these traditions of excellence which have served to connect us and push for a better world. By featuring voices and perspectives traditionally erased from the past, Jermaine not only captures our historical blind spots, he teaches us how history is a powerful tool for transforming change. Jermaine quotes Maya Angelou, history, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. It is in this spirit I bring you Jermaine Fowler and his topic today on silencing history. What a joy it is to be here today at the TJUC. And uh, I first wanna thank Ellen Wade. It was her profound curiosity that brought me here today because I did a podcast on Benjamin Banneker. And he was a free black man, one of the first free uh, black freedom fighters in America, and he had written a letter to Thomas Jefferson. And this letter was imploring him to end the institution of slavery. Now, we know how that letter turned out. Thomas Jefferson did not end the institution of slavery, but I recorded a show on that, and Ellen found me through that. So thank you so much to Ellen. I also want to thank Aaron for that beautiful accompaniment. I chose a Bob Marley song to stand here today to kind of get me up here and um you know i think that music is life whenever you are fond of someone they say that they're pulling at your heartstrings kind of like guitar strings or whenever you are you know you you hear the drum it's kind of like a heartbeat it's rhythmic so today i want to tell you who i am you may be wondering who i am standing here before you today well i am someone who is engaged with the untold and unrepresented stories from history I am someone who knows that in order to tell history, you also have to tell her story, their story, to get a full accompaniment of our story. So I created the Humanity Archive, and that is a website and a podcast where I tell these untold stories. And at the Humanity Archive, I'm unafraid. I'm unafraid to tell the stories of revolution. I'm unafraid to tell the stories of Slavery, I'm unafraid to tell the stories of those people who strove for things greater and grander than themselves. Hegel said that history is a slaughterhouse because of the victimizations and the atrocities, because of the blood and the tears. Napoleon said that history is but a set of lies agreed upon and Henry Ford, yes, the Henry Ford, who makes the cars, who, who uh, originated and innovated the automobile, he said that history is bunk. And I think a lot of people take this view of history as though we can't learn anything from history. It's just these stories in the past that we can't get anything from. But I am someone who believes that if we dig through that rubble of history, then we will come up with our deepest humanity. I also tell the stories of people who came before us, who overcame, who offered hope, those people who offered truth and resistance and struggle and who fought for justice. Stories like those of one of my favorite writers, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was a Unitarian minister. And even though he left the Unitarian church, I don't think the Unitarian church ever left him. And what does Emerson tell us? He says that he whosoever shall be a man, or I'll add to that woman, shall be a nonconformist. And I appreciate your nonconformity in struggling and wrestling with your name change from Thomas Jefferson Unitarian Church. Because what are you doing whenever you engage 
in a thought process that has you challenging the old narrative of a man, Thomas Jefferson. And when we wrestle with that legacy, this is a man who owned over 600 slaves. This is a man who destroyed the black family, a man who destroyed the black body, a man who destroyed black childhood. He had children working in a nail factory, child labor, a man who abused his female slaves. But on the other hand, we have a man who wrote the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. But the problem with that is the Declaration of Independence, that didn't go far enough because it didn't encompass the women, native people, black people, people of all genders and places coming from different places. So that is the legacy that I think we are still wrestling with today in America is how we reconcile those differences, that painful history with where we're trying to move forward. And that's why I think that it is urgent that we relearn history. Because in doing so, I think we have to have a tragic sense of history. One of the most important philosophers in Germany after World War II, his name was Theodore Adorno, and he said, the need to let suffering speak is a tradition of all truth. So we need to let history speak, and it's not always going to feel good. It's not always going to make you feel good. We're not talking about the type of history that we learn in school that engenders this kind of sort of patriotism and love of country. It might make the country look bad sometimes when we look back at that history. But what are we trying to do? We are trying to tell the truth about history. And when I say a tragic sense of history, I mean that it should engender a sense of pity. And I'm not talking about the pitiful where we walk past a homeless person, for instance, and you know just walk past and pretend like they're not there. No, I'm talking about a sense of pity that engenders a sense of compassion where you can look at other people who are different from yourself, who are from other places than yourself, who might be from the other side of town, and say, what are you going through? How can I be of service to you? So to unsilence history, I think, offers hope. Hope through those examples, again, of people who stood for something greater and grander. And I think having a tragic sense of history and unsilencing history is tied to a strong moral energy. And I think as a nation, we have to accurately and honestly teach. Textbooks have failed to connect the nation's past to its present. It was the great sociologist, one of my favorite uh, heroes from history, W.E.B. Du Bois, who said, one is astonished in the study of history at the recurrence of the idea that evil must be forgotten, distorted, skimmed over, the difficulty, of course, with this philosophy is that history loses its value as an incentive and an example. It paints perfect man and noble nations, but it does not tell the truth. But I also think that history can show us a path forward. So today I want to tie history to someone in the past, in my mind, one of the greatest reformers in American history. And this is a man by the name of Frederick Douglass. Now, where do we find Frederick Douglass in 1893? And this is Frederick Douglass at 75 years old. We find him at the World's Fair, and he is representing for Haiti because he is trying to foster a better relationship between America and the free black republic of Haiti. Fascinating story there. Definitely check that out. And he's there in front of about 2,500 fairgoers. So I'm assuming there was a large crowd in front of him. And this is a man who escaped slavery, escaped the sharp clutches of slavery, and he's still having to move forward and fight. You see, the fight for justice does not come with a retirement plan. It, it never ends. So he's 75 years old, he's up there, and he's trying to tell America that they need to have a better relationship with Haiti, and he gets a heckler. What does the heckler say? He says, what of the black problem? So this is, this is Douglas. He's standing up there, up there, and he straightens his back out. He takes his glasses off of his face, and he sets them on the podium. He runs his hand through his cloud of hair, and he says, America does not have a black problem. America has a nation problem. And the problem is that the word nation and black have interchanged. And until we look at everyone in the nation, as we look at ourselves, then we will always continue to have what you call a black problem. So until this nation has loyalty enough 
until it has truth enough, until it has compassion enough, then we will always have what you call a black problem. And I'll add, until we can, again, we can look at people who are different from ourselves, whether it be different skin colors, whether it be different sexualities, whether it be different genders, no matter what it is, until we can look at them as we look at ourselves, then we will always have this problem be wrestling with what Douglas was talking about. So I want to use Douglas just to teach you three lessons today, three quick lessons through the framework of Frederick Douglass. And what does he teach us? Because again, we should use history as it applies to the present and how it can help us move into the future. So lesson number one Douglass teaches us is our work is not done. Our work is not done because racism still casts its gloomy shadow over the landscape of America. Right now we are living in one of the most frightening times in American history with the coronavirus pandemic. We have ecological catastrophe impending. We have economic downturn. People are struggling. People are suffering. Our work is not done because we still have these problems to wrestle with and deal with. So again, the fight for justice is not something that you can retire from and it's continuous and it goes on. Our work is not done because America still clings to the legacy of white supremacy and racism. Shameless, unjustified, unreasonable terror still visits itself on poor and black communities. Our work is not done because black people are still three times more likely to be killed by the police than any other group, and less than 2% of the police are ever held accountable. And then whenever you realize that the police force itself is rooted in a racist past with these slave patrols, whose job it was to surveil the black neighborhood, contain the black neighborhood, not necessarily to protect the black neighborhood, so then you can make that connection to why many black people view the police with suspicion, while those on the other side of town view them as protectors. Our work is not done because mass incarceration is still a massive injustice, and the health disparities should make us feel sick. I could go on and on. And I think that Anton Chekhov, great poet, said it best when he says, indifference is a paralysis of the soul, a premature death, and I think that a lot of times we suffer from an apathy, from an indifference, which is worse than evil itself. We cannot be apathetic. We cannot be indifferent. What's the second lesson that Douglas teaches us? Douglas says that we should have the right to criticize American institutions. Now, there are a lot of people who, if you try to criticize America, they'll tell you to pack your bags and leave. Love it or leave it. Well, I don't believe that. Now, the word criticize comes from the Greek word kritikos, meaning capable of judging. And I think first we have to start within. We have to be Socratic. The great philosopher Socrates says what in line 38a of Plato's Apology? He says, the unexamined life is not worth living. And what does that mean? That means that you take your deepest beliefs, you put them up for interrogation. Your deepest values, you put them up for interrogation. That means those things you learned as a kid, you're going to put those up. Maybe those were some beliefs your parents taught you. Maybe they taught you that people who were different, it was wrong to be friends with someone who was different from you, or you were supposed to view things a certain way. It could be something you believe about yourself. You're going to criticize yourself, but in a loving way based in compassion. And then once you do that, then you're going to turn that lens on the institutions of America. So you're going to look at our police forces. Are they doing things the way they're supposed to do? You're going to look at our education system, and you're probably going to see a lot of our education system is dilapidated. It's not what it's supposed to be. You're going to turn your lens on the health institutions. You're going to turn your lens outward and bring that criticism to bear, because I think we're lacking a lot of times is a righteous indignation. We just look at things happening, and nobody says anything, and nobody does anything. So we should have the right to criticize American institutions. Because whenever you have a cut, you don't just ignore the cut. You have to look at it and see how it is to be healed, if it needs to be sold, or if maybe you just might need to put a Band-Aid on it. But at any rate, it'll only get worse if you ignore it. What is the last thing that Frederick Douglass wanted us to know? What did Douglass want the younger generation to know and understand? about the black freedom movement? What did he want us to know about the women's movement, the 
class struggle. What did he want us to know about keeping track of the empires, military bases all over the world? What did he want us to know? I think Douglas wanted us to know that we have to keep a moral energy. And I don't think personally that it has to be tied to religion. That choice of belief is up to you. But we need a collective moral strength. Time and time again, atrocities occur. Time and time again, inequality occurs. Gross crimes against humanity occur. And I wonder sometimes if we're experiencing a moral catastrophe. Where is the moral outrage? Where is the critique of the wrongdoing? I think we've suffered a lot of times massively from a moral bankruptcy. So I really hope today that unsilencing history can, can bring us out of that. I think that a moral energy has an enthusiasm to seek the common good. A moral energy gives us a spirit of acting in service to humanity, gives us a fire for pushing back, to call out wrongs, to stand up and fight, speak out for what's right. So again, to unsilence history is to see that no one people has a monopoly on civilization. No one people have a monopoly on truth. No one people have a monopoly on justice. This is what you're going to see when you study the history of everybody, when you study the history of all people, that no one has a monopoly on anything. And we are all connected more than we are different. To unsilence history is to realize and recognize that our history is not finished. And like the great James Baldwin said, we are trapped in history, and history is trapped in us. So I just wanted to come here today to tell you that history is unfinished. The future is open-ended. What we think and what we do makes a difference. God bless you, and good luck to you all. Thank you. That was great. Jermaine Fowler, you were amazing. That was an amazing message. Thank you so much. I <laughs> know. All right, I'm going to uh, end with the closing words and extinguish the chalice. This is by Joseph Cleveland. Uh, may we hear the melody of life. May we hear the melody of life and find ourselves singing harmony. May we be open to the dissonances in the song of the land and its people, that we might be part of the world's urging towards justice, peace, and love. May we feel in our bones the rhythms of life and the land and find ourselves dancing. Thank you.